Got it working. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk with you guys just today about a project I've had the privilege to work on, on and off for about five months now um, at our cartography lab at the University of Alabama. We've been asked to make a couple hundred new maps uh, for a new volume of this large textbook slash reference book about the rivers of North America. Uh, obviously, that's a lot of maps to have to make all from scratch, so, but I still want them to look nice, of course, and given the tight deadline we have, um, I'm going to go through some of the workflows I've adopted to kind of help streamline the map making process as much as possible. Um, so here are the river basins that are going to be included in the map. There are about 200 of them. Um, as you can see, these river basins have all sorts of different shapes, sizes, scales, topographies, physiographies, and they're all over the entire continent. Um, you can imagine this is fun to work on, but obviously each of these maps also entails its own set of unique challenges. But for all of the watersheds, we've been asked to highlight things such as rivers and lakes, obviously, uh, topography, major cities and towns, dams and impoundments, and even the physiographic regions that go in a watershed. Um, so even just the cartography aside, this is a lot of data to have to sift through, research, organize, and clean up. So a lot of our lab's work for the past several months has just been getting to a point where we can even start mapping. Um, but we did finally reach that point relatively recently, and we've started off by mapping out the rivers of the Mackenzie and the Yukon basins in the continents northeast, or northwest. Um, so I'll just sift through a couple of examples of stuff that we've made so far. Um, these are all still first drafts, so in terms of symbology and how they look, they might change as time goes on, but the stream or the processes to make these maps are relatively uh, grounded now. On um, the first map here, this is the Yellowknife River, namesake of the city of Yellowknife, and a very classic example of a Canadian Shield riverine system, just peppered with lakes and thousands of streams. It's a mess to go through. Uh, <laughs> a beautiful mess, yes. Uh, the second one is the Kantishna River in Alaska. It has the unique claim to being the drainage basin for the northern slope of Denali. And then this last one here is a very tiny uh, river system in Alberta called the Steep Bank System. Um, it's unique, though, for sitting right in the heart of Alberta's Athabasca oil sands region. So it suffers from a lot of the consequences of the mining of oil sands in that part of Canada. Uh, for today's demo, though, I'm going to be breaking down yet another map of a river basin in Canada, one that we're probably very familiar with in one way or another, the Klondike River, where there be gold and then there are hills. I shouldn't have done that. It was terrible. Uh, yeah, I'll be breaking down a couple things about this map today, how I created the terrain, how I organized and visualized uh, the hydrological data on the map, and then how I helped kind of draw out the watershed itself from the rest of its immediate surroundings. And I'll touch a little bit on the labeling as well. Uh, so starting out, I got a shapefile of the Klondike watershed from Canada's open data portal, and I've also gone ahead and drawn a little bounding box uh, around the river basin, which is set to the exact proportions of the final map, which is about a two to three ratio or three to two in this case. Now use that bounding box, of course, to clip out a DEM using GMT D2010 data uh, for the area of interest. And I'm gonna use this DEM to make three different layers. I'll make a hill shade, and then I'll make a texture shade, and then finally top that off with the hypsometric tint. Uh, I'll be making my hill shade using pyramid shader as well. Uh, so Tom gave us a nice introduction of it earlier this morning. So I'm gonna pretty much go through the same procedure as he did. Um, all of the maps are being produced at the editor's request at a relatively high vertical exaggeration, which as you can see, for a hilly region like this, this is messy. Uh, for flatter regions, though, it's perfect. Um, but to clean up the mess, we just go to the generalization tab and mess with the sliders and the settings a little bit. And you know, already just tweaking it a little bit, I think it looks a lot better from, for you know, making maps that are gonna be quite small in their final form. They are going to be this small, actually. All of them. Um, I'm also going to tweak the illumination a little bit. Uh, there's an academic paper floating around there um, that talks about how north-northwest might actually be the optimal direction for doing single illumination hill shade. So I've been playing with that value um, in making these maps. I'm quite happy with it so far. And then one last thing I'm going to do after I save that image is, is I'm going to go back to the visualization tab and I'm going to change my viewing mode over to hypsometric color. And then I can save this new file actually as a kind of generalized DEM that takes on the exact same generalization settings that we use to make the hill shade. And I'm going to use this generalized DEM to make my texture shade. 
Um, I happen to use Natural Scene Designer to make it, but as we learned this morning, we can now all do it using a very easy to use Python application. Uh, and then, of course, this is the output of that. Oh, yeah, that. All right. And the last thing I'll do with that DM is I'm going to go back in QGIS, and I've created like a custom um, scheme, a color scheme that's a, uh, oh my goodness, yeah, it's uh, green to yellow to white, kind of Imhoff inspired scene where the darkest greens are found at the floor of Death Valley and the high, you know, white is really only found around the heights near Denali because I have to, you know, cover an entire continent for each of these maps. I want their scheme to look relatively consistent throughout. Um, now, once I've changed the colors of that DM, I'm going to save it as a rendered image instead of as a raw DM. That way, when I bring it to Photoshop, it will retain all the colors that I gave it here in QGIS. Speaking of Photoshop, I start out with just the hillshade as my base layer. I place the texture shade on top of it. I set its blending mode to multiply, and I bring down the opacity of that image a little bit just to make the, make the scene a little bit less dark. Uh, and then I'm going to do kind of the same thing with the hypsometric tint, drop it on top of those two layers, set its blending mode to multiply. And then I do one last thing where I apply an adjustment layer to those three um, previous layers that helps brighten the image a little bit, but also kind of tones down the contrast uh, of it a little bit as well. And then, of course, resize it, make sure in this case it's six inches by four inches, 600 DPI. And once that's done, we can start dealing with the hydrological data. Uh, so the bulk of the data processing that I was mentioning earlier really dealt with assigning some sort of rank scaling system to large scale river data. Um, as it became very apparent early on that me trying to decide how wide I should make individual river lines on a map to map basis would take way too long. I'm plenty familiar with the rivers in Alabama, for example, so it's easy to do it for there. But I go to Montana, Nova Scotia, Chihuahua, I have no idea what rivers are more important than which other ones. So my solution was to turn to the only data set I knew of, at least, that had a ranking scheme for rivers across the entire continent, which happens to be natural earth. And I applied the rankings from that data set to the larger scale data that I have across the continent. Um, so starting out, I'm going to clip out all of the minor streams within the Klondike Basin. Um, for these purposes, minor streams are just rivers that don't appear in natural earth whatsoever. Um, they don't have a rank. And I only clip them to the Klondike Basin specifically because I don't want the rest of the map to be over cluttered with unnecessary hydrological detail, since the Klondike, after all, is the focus of this map. Um, then I'm going to clip out all of the rivers that I have which do have rankings, and I'll clip it out to the entire bounding box just to help provide additional geographic context to where we are. And then finally, we will clip out the water bodies to the bounding box as well. And I will make a note here that Canada's vector data set at this scale represents wider river courses as polygons instead of lines. Not an issue yet, but it will come into play a little bit later. Now import that bounding, bounding box into Illustrator um, using Map Publisher, and then once that's done, I import the water data as well, and it should go exactly where it's supposed to. Uh, and I went ahead and gave it a pretty water blue. Um, and this is the part where all that work I put into processing the data previously is going to start to pay off because um, we need to figure out, you know, what is the fastest way to assign individual widths to the different rivers. And so my solution has been this. Um, for the unranked streams, we can give them a really small stroke size, and we do that very easily because all of those happen to be within the same layer, just a one and done process. However, that becomes much more complicated with the ranked rivers that we have because they also happen to all just be found in a single layer. But because Map Publisher preserves attribute data, it's actually really easy to make a precise selection based on the scale rank that I'm interested in modifying. Um, so you'll see here I've set up a simple selection query that will grab all of the lines in this layer that have a rank value of either 11 or 12. I'll add them new to a new selection. And with just a click of a button, all the rivers with those scale ranks have been selected. And you'll notice the Klondike wasn't selected, so we're good to go. Now it's easy to just apply a new stroke width to it. Um, now they're much thinner, but they're still a little bit thicker than the unranked streams. So we're starting to get a visual hierarchy here. Um, the Klondike River has a scale rank of 10, so I'm going to run the same procedure on it and give it a slightly thicker stroke width as well. The Yukon, on the other hand, you'll notice have, is a polygon. It has a whopping scale rank of 3, though, but for this purpose, um, because this polygon happens to be so much wider than any of the lines we're working with, I'm fine with leaving it as it is. However, you might have noticed there is a tiny little piece of the Klondike River 
that is still very, very thin, and that is because it is a polygon. Um, the easy solution to fixing this, I just take whatever stroke width I gave to the corresponding river line, I divide it by two, and then I apply that as the stroke width for that polygon. And the thinness more or less goes away. Is it? Is it more than um, yeah, once I've gotten all that ready to go, I'll bring it into Photoshop, and then I like to apply a little bevel effect to the water, um, just to help visually embed it into the landscape. Uh, I think helping doing this imbues it and provides more depth and nuance to the hydrological representation that we're going for here. Um, now I'm gonna try and bring the terrain and hydrology as a single merge layer back into Illustrator, and here I'm gonna try and kill two birds with one stone. I want to make it so that only the terrain and water within the Klondike are in focus. And then I'm also going to apply a very slight drop shadow to the river basin itself just to help make it pop a bit more. Um, so to start, I import my shape file of the Klondike basin. I made it a giant, enormous black blob, which is the exact opposite of what we're trying to do. Um, but that's okay, we'll get there. Um, to achieve the fading away effect for the entire map, I'm going to apply a layer mask that is 80% uh, gray, which as you can see, unfortunately, it's also fading out our river basin. So I will take that river basin shape, paste it in place right on top of that gray rectangle we just made, give it a fill of white, and now everything that is underneath that part of the mask will appear as if there was no mask at all. Um, then I, very, I applied a very subtle drop shadow effect onto that shape, and now all we have to do is take care of the black fill. So if I select the individual shape itself, give it a layer mask, and leave it black, we have now eliminated the black blob and we can very easily see the basin in and of itself. Um, I'll touch on the labeling real quick as well. Um, I, I do all of my labeling in Illustrator, but this obviously isn't very readable as it is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring all those labels back into Photoshop I'll do two things. I'm going to apply something I picked up from Daniel Huffman. Uh, call, he calls them smart type halos. I guess these are smart type glows in my case. Yeah. Uh, which basically means that the glows applied here are modified by a layer mask of their own in such a way that the glows really are only applied where they're needed, so in the darker portions of the map in this particular case. And then to top that off, just to make, in this case, the physiographic provinces uh, label a little bit more readable, I'm going to take something I got from Joshua Stevens' Twitter feed, where I'm going to select all the text and apply a blur effect to the image directly beneath the text. That way it helps subdue a lot of the muddiness that would otherwise make it difficult to read. And that's it. That's the Klondike River Basin and all of its glory. Um, obviously, things change on a river-to-river -river basin basis, sometimes the most difficult and time-consuming part of it is figuring out what cities deserve, you know, need to be in this map, if there are any at all. Um, figuring out the physiographic regions, that was a nightmare in and of itself. Um, the, I, yeah. Um, but this, the process doesn't change from map to map, and I've managed to make some of these remarkably quickly, depending on the circumstances. I think my record is an hour, 15 minutes. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's really it. And thank you.